I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem of algebraic loops uh, in a bond graph causality assignment. Um, we've already seen that um, in deriving equations it, it's a significant aid to have um, identified independent energy storage elements right using integral causality. And this helps us right define the system state vector and um, we've also discussed how if energy storage elements are not independent then by derivative causality we can find out those that are dependent and those energy storage elements the state of those elements will not contribute to the state vector now we've also seen that when we do have derivative causality what that practically means is that um, we need to eliminate um, certain terms uh, in the equations that result from the differentiation of the state variables. And so there's a little bit more algebraic manipulation that's needed to get the state equations into proper form where they're only functions of states and inputs. Uh, again, because of the influence of that energy storage element or some some cases you could have multiple dependent energy storage elements. We're going to find that when there's an algebraic loop in a system, um, we can see that also in the causality assignment. Now that's a little bit different because a, an algebraic loop arises when after you've already assigned all the causality and, and given all the causal assignments to energy storage elements, there are still some arbitrary assignments to be made, and those are different from derivative causalities. Um, and in order to finish out causality on the, on the rest of the bond graph, you have to make these causal assignments, and most of the time you're gonna find that it's because of resistive elements. Sometimes if you have too many resistive elements in a, in a, in a certain type of structure, that's when you'll see um, an algebraic loop. Uh, what is the similar in derivative to derivative causality is that you can identify this condition before you start deriving equations and you're going to see also that of course as the name implies it it um, it does add to the algebraic manipulation but you can still use causality to help you guide the, the derivation of the equations and uh, that's good practice in general now we've seen that something that we can call an integration loop is the best case scenario and I'm just using a simple example here. And when you have a dynamic system model, from the standpoint of ease in the der derivation of the equations, um, if all the energy storage elements are independent, that makes life a lot easier. Um, and what happens is, you know, in this case, for example, we would have integral causality on the C here. Then we would have to finish causality by assigning effort into that R. And we have a sort of integration loop here. In other words, for example, now you can think of here starting a computing loop here. We could find from an initial condition first, right? We first would know the initial state of QC, say, at say at some time zero. We could easily find well what is the what is the voltage? Voltage would allow you to find the right you look at causally the voltage across the resistor. So VR is minus VC, right, through the equations in this one junction. Given VR, then we could find, right, IR by this constitutive relation for the resistive element. And in return, we could then compute what is the rate of change of, of the state, which would then allow us to form, if you like, a little loop here in our computation by taking the integral here with respect to time we could then find right Q again and then we could continue our calculations right so in this nice scenario we have an integration loop so what's an algebraic loop well if you look up algebraic loop and do a search on the internet you mostly find a lot of references to computational environments, especially uh, block diagram descriptive languages. So I'd like to show you what that means in that context. So the context, the concept of an algebraic loop in, in dynamic system modeling arises when 
you have a system variable that you're trying to find. And in our case, you know, that's going to be either an effort or a flow. And you find that when you're trying to solve for that, it ends up being a function of itself. Algebra in, in, in an algebraic loop, no integration, right? As opposed to the integration loop I just showed you, which then makes it possible for us to resolve that loop. When you have algebraic relations in that loop, it means that you have to solve algebraic equations rather than a differential equation, okay? You can think of a real simple case in a block diagram form like this. I need to find y, but in order to find y, it depends on itself, right? So in a block diagram, this can happen in, in a real simple sense this way. Sometimes in comp computing environments that use block diagrams, this loop here may not be so obvious, and when the software is trying to resolve the determination of a certain variable, it may pop up a message and say, hey, you've got an algebraic loop. And it's basically implicit in the calculation that you would need that variable in order to solve for that variable. That's an algebraic loop. We're going to see that we can see this through the algebra in our derivation of our equations, right? So this type of condition is not unusual. And again, Sometimes it arises because maybe your model has been oversimplified, or maybe even the system that you're trying to, to model hasn't been properly designed. So the neat thing about what we can do with a bond graph is, you know, first, we can identify an algebraic loop, as we'll show shortly. And then second, again, we can use causality not only to identify the algebraic loop, but to help us resolve it and determine what's the right path towards the solution. Now let's look at how an algebraic loop pops up in a bond graph, especially through causality assignment, and I've chosen two really simple examples. Here's an overly simplified problem that just has two resistive elements. How would we proceed here? There's no energy storage elements, but that's okay. Start off with our source, and there's your input source, apply causality. Now you're at a one junction, and remember at a one junction, you can only have one flow, and there's no energy storage element to tell us there's no source. So we need to now arbitrarily choose either this R or this R. When you have this kind of arbitrary decision where an R is going to make the decision for you as to say which determines the flow, now this is an effort, that signals an algebraic loop. There's no differential equations here, is there? There's no states. It's just an algebraic equation that we'd have to solve in order to determine the variables on these bonds, right? But that fact, that arbitrariness there, uh, tells us that we have one, basically like one algebraic equation to solve. Let's look at this case, input effort. There is an energy storage element here, so that won't seem so weird to some of you. So here's an input effort. Now I've got an I element. OK, let's give this independent. So my state x is whatever this momentum variable is, p. There's no other energy storage element, so it's a first order system. Now I've determined the flow on this one junction, so this has to be an effort here. Now that flow is determined into a zero, and well, I've got a zero with one flow in and nothing else to tell me what is the preferred causality, or is there any source telling me? No, again, arbitrary. Arbitrarily, I choose this bond to tell me the effort, then I can finish the causality, right? One effort in here, that's an, that signals an algebraic loop. Okay, so I've shown you some very simple cases how that algebraic loop is detected. The consequence on the equations uh, I need to show you next. Again, in equation derivation um, with algebraic loops, depending on the number of arbitrary assignments, there might be multiple algebraic equations that we'll have to solve, right? Um, if the relations are linear, and remember, those algebraic relations usually result 
through the constitutive relations of the R elements. If these are linear, then sometimes you can solve for the variables, maybe as one algebraic equation or even multiple algebraic equations, and then you can eliminate them symbolically so that at the end of the day you can write a set of nice first order equations the way we like here. By the way, again, I forgot to put in the, the U's, the inputs. Um, if the constitutive relations for the R elements or some equations in those algebraic relations are not linear, sometimes those can't be solved. Then what you'd have is, you know, a set of, you know, say nonlinear equations in the states and the inputs, and then you might have a set of nonlinear equations also in terms of states and inputs, say equal to a function of zero, equal to zero, and now you've got a set of differential algebraic equations that you'd have to solve, and there are computer codes that'll solve these for you, right? Um, so this is basically the problem, is that now we've got algebraic equations that if you can resolve these and insert key variables in here and eliminate these equations, that's nice. Sometimes that's not always possible. In another sense, um, you know, we sometimes put emphasis on finding the model equations for bond graphs of dynamic systems, you know, where you have inherently energy storage elements that give you dynamics. But I wanted to make clear that, you know, as, as I showed with that real simple, you know, example where I just had an effort source with uh, two resistive elements, you can have bond graphs, you know, a lot of circuits that you might have studied are purely resistive, right? They're only resistive elements. You might even have transformers, gyrators, but there's no energy storage elements. Um, now, every problem that you would solve this way is always going to be algebraic. And that's okay. It just means that you don't have dynamic equations. So that means that you have to solve simultaneous, right, algebraic equations. Many of the problems that you might have seen in circ electric circuits, and even in solving some hydraulic networks where you're trying to find fluid flows through multiple networks of pipes and so on uh, at steady state, right, those are going to be um, algebraic problems. Sometimes we even will build a dynamic model, remove the energy storage elements, and force this into an algebraic group problem because we can then only solve for that steady state. We don't care about solving for the dynamics. In those cases, we force ourselves into this kind of problem. And the same way we derive the equations for an algebraic loop, we can solve or resolve actually derive the equations for uh, resistive systems or steady state problems. And that's a very valuable tool in a lot of very practical problems.